All right, this week's Torah portion is Miketz, which literally means at the end. So from, just from this title, I want you to keep in the back of your mind that this is um, a type and shadow for the end times. Um, we know that the end is declared from the beginning and everything that has been will be again. Uh, so keep that in the back of your mind as we go through this. We've already seen many types and shadows between Yosef and Yeshua, and we're, we're going to see a couple more types and shadows today. So with that, let's crack on. Genesis Bereshit 41. And so for context, let's remember what's happened to Yosef so far. He's been sold by his brothers to the Ishmaelites and Midianites, taken down to Egypt, and he's been in pot he's, we had the whole thing with Potiphar's wife. So um, Yosef became great in the house of Potiphar. And he was in charge of everything. And then he was falsely accused of basically sleeping with Potiphar's wife. And we saw that as an act of mercy, Potiphar sent him to jail as opposed to killing him outright. And so now Yosef is in jail unrighteously. And it came to be at the end of two years time. So this is two years after Yosef revealed the dreams of the baker and um, the chief cupbearer. So another two years later, that Pharaoh had a dream and saw him standing by the river and saw seven cows coming up out of the river, fine looking and fat, and they fed amongst the reeds and then saw another seven cows coming up out of after them out of the river, ugly and lean of flesh, and stood by the other cows on the bank of the river. And the ugly and the lean of flesh cows ate up the seven fine looking and fat cows. Then Pharaoh awoke, and he slept and he dreamed a second time, and saw seven heads of grain coming up on one stalk, plump and good, and saw seven lean heads scorched by the east wind coming up after them. And the seven lean heads swallowed the seven plump and complete heads. Then Pharaoh awoke and saw it was a dream. And it came to be that his spirit was moved and he sent and called for all the magicians of Mitzrayim and all its wise men. I've underlined that his spirit was moved because I think we can all say that in our life, Yah will stir your spirit. Sometimes he will disturb your peace. You can be going along just fine, life, everything's dandy. And then there's just something. He does something. There's something's missing. You realize you need something. And that usually is uh, the catalyst for you seeking him, uh, studying, fasting. Um, I speak from experience and I see a few nods actually. So yeah, that's great. So clearly uh, I'm suggesting that Yah is stirring Pharaoh's spirit. And Pharaoh related to them, the magicians, his dreams, but there was no one who could interpret them for Pharaoh. It is at this point that the chief cup bearer remembers Yosef. Remember when Yosef foretold the dream, he says, put in a good word for me at Pharaoh, and the chief cup bearer forgot. Now he remembers. The chief cup bearer tells Pharaoh how Yosef interpreted both his and the baker's dream, and how they both came to pass according to the interpretation. So Pharaoh orders Yosef to be brought before him. Then Pharaoh sent and called Yosef, and they hurriedly brought him out of the dungeon, and he shaved and changed his garments and came to Pharaoh. What's interesting, to stand before the king, one must change his garments. You can't just rock up in your prison attire. You've got to change your garments. This alludes to Yeshua's parable of the wedding feast in Matthew 22. And when the sovereign came in to view the guests, he saw there was a man who had not put on a wedding garment. And he said to him, friend, how did you come in here not having a wedding garment? And he was speechless. And we know what happens to this guy. He's bound hand, hand and foot, cast out into our outer darkness. In Revelation, we know that the garments is the righteousness of the saints. Do we have white garments? Because if not, we're not going to stand before the king. Let's keep going. And Pharaoh said to Yosef, I have dreamed a dream and there is no one to interpret it. Now I myself have heard it is said of you that you understand a dream to interpret it. And Yosef answered Pharaoh saying, it is not in me. Let Elohim answer with peace. I love this. Yosef is not taking credit for what Elohim has done or worked through him. Can we do, do we, um, when good things happen and we know that it was Elohim's doing, do we give him the glory or when someone asks, do we say, I did it? I suggest, let, let's give the glory that is due to our Elohim. 
And Pharaoh said to Yosef, See, in my dream, I stood on the bank of the river and saw seven cows coming up out of the river, fine-looking and fat, and they fed amongst the reeds. Then saw another seven cows coming up after them, poor and very ugly and lean of flesh, such ugliness I have never seen in all the land of Mitzrayim. And the lean of flesh and the ugly cows ate up the first seven, the fat cows. Yet when they had eaten them up, no one would have known that they had eaten them, for they were as ugly as at the beginning. Then I awoke. I've underlined that because that wasn't in the original description of the dream at the beginning of the chapter. And we're going to see later on that Yosef answers this particular thing with amazing wisdom. Also, I looked in my dream and saw seven heads coming up on one stalk, complete and good. Then saw seven heads withered and lean, scorched by the east wind coming up after them. And the lean heads swallowed the seven good heads. And I spoke to the magicians, but there was no one who could explain it to me. And Yosef said to Pharaoh, the dream of Pharaoh is one. Elohim has shown Pharaoh what he is about to do. I love that none of this, oh, let me go off into my room and pray on it. Let, I'll come back to you in a week. There and then, he gave him the interpretation. And we're going to see that this was by the spirit of Yah, by the Ruach. The seven good cows are seven years, and the seven good heads are seven years. It is one dream. And the seven lean and ugly cows which came up after them are seven years, and the seven empty heads scorched by the east wind are seven years of scarcity of food. This is the word which I spoke to Pharaoh. Elohim has shown Pharaoh what he is about to do. See, seven years of great plenty are coming in all the land of Mitzrayim. But after them seven, after them seven years of scarcity of food shall arise, and all the plenty shall be forgotten in the land of Mitzrayim. This is going back to what I underlined a few slides ago about how Pharaoh said you, that you wouldn't have even known the seven ugly cows had eaten seven fat cows. And the scarcity of food shall destroy the land, and the plenty shall not be remembered in the land because of the scarcity of food, of food following, for it is very severe. Just let's apply this to us. We, in my personal experience, you kind of go through seasons. Uh, so you have a season where everything's going great and you and you are just buddies and you're talking and then you go through that lull where everything's scarce and scripture just, you know, it's just words coming at you and you don't understand it and you feel Yah is completely distant. Do we forget the plenty when we're going through the trials? And the dream was repeated to Pharaoh twice because the word is established by Elohim and Elohim is hastening to do it. And now let Pharaoh look for a discerning and wise man and set him over the land of Mitzrayim. Now, what I love about this, Yosef doesn't just give the interpretation, he now gives, pro he gives solutions. Um, my, one of my employees used to say this, I don't want to hear problems, I want to hear solutions. Don't tell me what's wrong, tell me how to fix it. And Yosef is going above and beyond. He, Pharaoh just asked for an interpretation. Yosef has given him how to rectify the problem. Let Pharaoh do this and let him appoint overseers over the land to take up one fifth of the land of Mitzrayim in the seven years of plenty. And let them gather all the food of those good years that are coming and store up the grain under the hand of Pharaoh and let them keep food in the cities. And the food shall be for a store for the land for the seven years of scarcity of food, which shall be in the land of Mitzrayim. And do not let the land be cut off by the scarcity of food. And the word was good in the eyes of Pharaoh and in the eyes of all his servants. And Pharaoh said to his servants, could we find another like him, a man in whom is the spirit of Elohim? Wow. A pagan king could look at this prisoner and go, there's something different about you. Can the same be said of us? Because we're supposed to have at least an earnest a, a deposit of this Holy Spirit. But is it, I'm not saying that we should be, you know, like uprooting mountains by faith, but there should be something different. People should be able to look and go, hmm, what is it that you have that I don't have? Now we see that he had the spirit of Elohim in him. 
This reminded me of Isaiah 11. And a rod shall come forth from the stump of Yishai, and a sprout from his roots shall bear fruit. The spirit of Yah shall rest upon him, the spirit of wisdom and understanding, the spirit of counsel and might, the spirit of knowledge and the fear of Yah, and shall make him breathe in the fear of Yah, and he shall not judge by the sight of his eyes, nor decide by the decide by the hearing of his ears this is a foreshadowing of messiah but what i'm alluding to is that yosef acted with uh, what, what did he do he had wisdom and understanding to be able to interpret the dream he was able to counsel pharaoh with this wisdom and might we'll see that he eventually became second in charge he had knowledge and he feared elohim how did he fear him he ascribed all glory to elohim when he was asked you have interpretations he's like no 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 Elohim has the interpretation. I'm simply a vessel. Yosef, and I've put here, this is another way how Yosef is a type and shadow of the Messiah. It's just amazing. Let's go back to our Torah portion. Then Pharaoh said to Yosef, since Elohim has shown you all this, look, this is amazing. Pharaoh knows where the knowledge is coming from. Elohim is being glorified in the process. There is no one as discerning and wise as you. Be over my house, you yourself, and at your mouth all my people shall be equipped. Only in the throne I am greater than you. He's essentially in the same position as he was in Potiphar's house, but now over all of Egypt. So we actually see that what happened at Potiphar's house was training. Training for, this, for his destiny. And obviously we know he was wrongfully accused and sent to jail. Well, that turned out to be a good thing. Because if it hadn't been for that, he wouldn't be stood before Pharaoh. What I'm saying is that you can be in training and something that is seemingly evil in our eyes will actually be for our better good in the long run. Remember that to improve yourself, there's growing pains. Trials and tribulations is what causes that pressing of the olives and makes us wise. And Pharaoh said to Yosef, See, I have set you over all the land of Mitzrayim. And Pharaoh took his seal ring off his hand and put it on Yosef's hand. And he dressed him in garments of fine linen and put a gold chain around his neck. This corresponds to this. I greatly rejoice in Yah. My being exalts in my Elohim. For he has put on garments of deliverance on me. The, the, the word there is garments of Yeshua. He has covered me with the robe of righteousness. As a bridegroom decks himself with ornaments. And as a bride adorns herself with her jewels. Remember what I said. This is a type and shadow of what will be at the end. And we know that Yosef is a type and shadow of Messiah. There's uh, people there. And he had him arrive in the second chariot which he had and cried out before him, bow the knee. And he set him over all the land of Mitzrayim. Again, this is a type and shadow. Philippians 2 says, Elohim therefore has highly exalted him, that is Yeshua, and given him the name which is above every name, that at the name of Yeshua every knee should bow, of those in heaven and of those on earth and of those under the earth. And every tongue should confess that Yeshua Messiah is master to the esteem of Elohim the Father. Can we see how the exaltation of Yosef is a type and shadow of the exaltation of Yeshua? What's interesting, this happens in Egypt. Now, what is happening right now? We're in the dispersion. And I would suggest that Yeshua is beginning to be exalted amongst us in Egypt. Because Egypt being the metaphor of the word, uh, world. Sorry. Let's go back to our Torah portion. Is everyone with me? Everyone keeping up? Cool. And Pharaoh said to Yosef, I am Pharaoh, and without a word from you, let no man lift his hand or foot in all of the land of Mitzrayim. And Pharaoh called Yosef's name Zaphnat Panea, and he gave him as a wife Asenat, the daughter of Potiphera, priest of On. And Yosef went out all over the land of Mitzrayim. Now, Zaphnat Panea has two meanings. It means revealer of secrets, or also to whom secrets are revealed. Remember what Pharaoh said earlier, since Elohim has revealed all of this to you. So because Yosef was able to have this secret from Elohim, the interpretation of the dream, and not only that, the wisdom to know what to do in this situation, this is what Yosef is called. He's given a special name, maybe a name above all names. Now let's look at this again. 
Psalm 78, my people, give ear to my Torah, incline your ears to the words of my mouth. I open my mouth in a parable, I utter riddles of old. He's, I'm going to get to a point. In Matthew 13, and the taught ones came to him and said, why do you speak to them in parables? And he answering them said to them, because it has been given to you to know the secrets of the reign of the heavens, but to them it has not been given. For whoever possesses, to him more shall be given, and he shall have overflowingly. But he, whoever who does not possess, even what he possesses shall be taken away from him. You then hear the parable of the sower. So basically Yeshua could take the word of the king, the father, the riddles of old, things that, you know, the prophecies, and he was able to speak them and unwrap the parables, but he spoke in secret. So I'm trying to draw the type and shadow of him being the revealer of secrets. Now, I just want to quickly point out, as a side note, verse 12, whoever possesses to him all shall be given. And that Christianity loves to use that verse in a sense of we need to have lots of material possessions and lots of material goods and I should be blessed. What is this speaking about? What's the context? No. It's knowledge. Because it has, look at verse 11, because it has been given to you to know the secrets of the reign of heaven, but to them it has not been given. Now, if you possess that secret and you understand it, more shall be revealed to you. But if you willingly shun the truth, what's he going to do? He's going to take it away from you, give you up to your own desires. Look, this is what this is about. It, there is authority in there, but I would say it's more to do with the knowledge of the secret of the reign of the heavens. But that's just as an aside for further study. So what I'm doing here is, let's parallel Yeshua and Yosef again. We did lots of parallels last week. There's some more that have come out in this portion. Yosef was called Zaphnat Panea, i.e. revealer of secrets. Now, Yeshua revealed the secrets of the kingdom. We've just covered this because it has been given to you to know the secrets of the reign of the heavens. More importantly, he revealed the Father. The the Jewish people thought they knew the Father. And Yeshua's like, no, you don't know the Father. Let me show you. And he says, he who has seen me has seen the Father. Again, Yeshua is revealing to us. And we know that the Father is the Son that reveals the Father to whom he pleases. Both were filled with the Spirit. We read this. Uh, Could we find another like him? A man in whom is the Spirit of Elohim. And Yeshua, being filled with the set-apart spirit, this is straight after his baptism, returned to the Yardain and was led by the spirit into the wilderness. As an aside, as soon as Yeshua was filled with the spirit, he was taken straight to tribulation. So it, sometimes tribulation coming your, your way is from Yah. Both were crowned with glory and honor. We just read this. Pharaoh says to Yosef, be over my house, you yourself. You are second in charge over all of Egypt. Hebrews 2.9 But we do see him who was made for a little while lower than the messengers, Yeshua, because of the suffering of death, crowned with esteem and respect, that by the favour of Elohim he should taste death for everyone. Both were given a Gentile bride. I don't know if you guys picked up on that. And Pharaoh gives Yosef, Asenat, the daughter of Potiphera, priest of On. This is a pagan priest, just to let you know. So we have the type and shadow. Now what's the spiritual... Paul says, for I gave you, speaking to the Corinthians, Gentiles, marriage to one husband to present you as an innocent maiden, a virgin, to Messiah. So we know that, can you see the type and shadow I'm trying to show? Let's go back to the Torah portion. And to Yosef were born two sons before the years of scarcity of food came, whom Asenat, the daughter of Potiphar, a priest of On, bore to him. And Yosef called the name of the firstborn Manasseh, for Elohim has made me forget all my toil and all my father's house. He was probably thinking, about time. (laughs) And the name of the second he called Ephraim, for Elohim has caused me to bear fruit in the land of my affliction. Now, the result of the Egyptian bride and Messiah coming together should be the birth of children. So what I'm trying to say is, is that as the, the scattered tribes, the Gentiles, are coming in and are working with Messiah, the result should be disciples, i.e. sons and daughters, if they're working in harmony. And all this is supposed to be happening in Egypt, the world, before we go back in. Are people with me? Cool. 
Galatians 3. Let, let's look on this um, children thing about the bride and Messiah and let's look at what happens. Um, well, on the spot, when you came out of the world, have you now suddenly gone, all of this doesn't matter anymore? I've forgotten about all my... I mean, look, I had a bit of a rough life, you know, and now that I've come into Torah belief, I'm free from that. I, you know, certain things that had happened to me in the past don't bother me anymore. You know, and I would, you know, there would... I, I would have had the right to penalise that person and go, how could you have done this to me? It doesn't bother me. I have forgotten all that tour. Everything that's happened up to this point, like, it doesn't matter. What, what matters is onwards and upwards. And not only that, after you've forgotten everything of your past troubles, you now bear fruit. What is bearing fruit? Be bearing fruit worthy unto repentance, fruit of righteousness. Now that I've forgotten my past... I can now move on upwards and work and work for the kingdom. So then you're saying that you cannot uh, bear fruit um, unless you forget your past. I'm saying that sometimes your past can impede you. Like it, it, I can still bear fruit, but maybe not as much. You know, so uh, think of the thorns and thistles from the parable of the sower. Sometimes, I mean, you can still bear fruit, just but things are preventing you from bearing more. Do you know I mean if you're so focused on the, if you're looking that way, why are you looking that way? When you should be, do you see what I mean? You can't. It, it goes back to this analogy as well. You can't serve two masters. You should be wholly focused on there. Anything that's pulling you back. This is the idea of maybe looking back on the plow from the plow. You start veering off. I'm not saying you can't bear fruit, but it might impede the amount of fruit. Does that make sense? Let, now, go, let's bring this back to the Egyptian bride, Messiah coming together, children bearing forth. For you are all sons of Elohim, how through belief in Messiah Yeshua. For as many of you were immersed into Messiah, have put on Messiah. There is no Yehudite, nor Greek. There is no slave, nor free. There is not male or female, for you are all one. Echad in Messiah Yeshua. And if you are of Messiah, then you are the seed of Abraham, of Abraham, and heirs according to the promise. You are now children of Abraham, and you can now reap the benefit of the promises now let's link this back in the seven years of plenty the ground brought forth generously I'm going to build a picture and he gathered all the food of the seven years which were in the land of Mitzrayim and laid up food in the cities he laid up in every city the food of the field which surrounded them so what food is this talking about grain Thus Yosef gathered very much grain as the sand of the sea, until he ceased counting, for it was without number. Now this, the, as the sand of the sea, should remind us of the promise made to Abraham. By myself I have sworn, declares Yah, because you have done this and have not withheld your son, your only son, <laughs> that I shall certainly bless you and shall increase your seed as the stars of heavens and as the sand which is on the seashore and let your seed possess the gate of their enemies. Can people see the, um, the similarities? So we have, thus Yosef gathered very much grain, seed, as the sand of the sea and Abraham's seed, his children, shall be as the sand on the seashore without number. And in your seed, all the nations of the earth shall be blessed because you have obeyed my voice. Now, in Isaiah 53, this is talking of Yeshua as the suffering servant, i.e. Messiah ben Yosef. But Yah was pleased to crush him. He laid sickness on him that when he made himself an offering for guilt, he would see a seed. I'm going to tie this all together, I promise. And he would prolong his days and the pleasure of Yah would prosper in his hand. He would see the result of the suffering of his life and be satisfied. Through his knowledge, my righteous servant makes many righteous, i.e. as the sand of the sea, and he bears their crookedness. 
Therefore, I give him a portion among the great. He divides the spoil with the strong because he poured out his being unto death and he was counted with the transgressors and he bore the sin of many. Again, as two, like, without number, and made intercession for the, strength, for the transgressors. Sorry. So let's tie this now. Thus Yosef gathered very much grain as the sand of the sea. We have Messiah, the type and shadow of Messiah, gathering his seed which we know is the seed of Abraham, which will be as the sand of the sea. This is the seed of Abraham, which is what we read. If you are of Messiah, then you are the seed of Abraham and heirs according to the promise. So the type and shadow is Joseph gathers lots of seed. The spiritual aspect of this is that we are the, that seed and we are being gathered who by? Messiah. Does this tie in now to maybe how the ten tribes are going to be gathered? Where is this happening? In Egypt. Are people seeing the type and shadow? Everyone with me? I have a puzzled face over here. <laughs> um, if you have questions, hound me afterwards, yeah? But I, I'm trying to show that Yosef basically pulling in all the, the seed is a type and shadow of what Yeshua is doing right now in the world. And we are that seed. And what was the result of this? The whole world had food. The whole world had bread. What is bread? The word. Can you see what I'm trying to get at? Anyway, let's move forward. When Yaakov saw that there was grain in Mitzrayim, Yaakov said to his sons, why do you look at each other? Why are you standing around? Do something. And he said, see, I have heard there is grain in Mitzrayim. Go down to that place and buy food for us there and let us live and not die. And Yosef's ten brothers went down to buy grain in Mitzrayim. But Yaakov did not send Yosef's brother Binyamin with his brothers, for he said, lest some harm come to him. Again, this favoritism. Jacob can't seem to shake that. And Yosef was the governor of the land. He was the one who sold all, to all the people of the land. And Yosef's brothers came and bowed down before him with their faces to the earth. And Yosef saw his brothers and recognized them. But he acted as a stranger to them and spoke with them harshly and said to them, Where do you come from? And they said, From the land of Canaan to buy food. So Yosef recognized his brothers, but they did not recognize him. Yeshua recognized his brothers, but his brothers did not recognize Yeshua. Can you see the type and shadow it played out in Yeshua's day? And Yosef remembered the dreams which he had dreamed about them and said to them, You are spies. You have come to see the nakedness of the land. So Yosef puts the ten brothers in prison for three days. Again, three days shows up. How many tribes in the northern kingdom? Ten. ten. What happens on the third day? Resurrection. So they're released, the ten brothers are released from prison on the third day. Now Yosef said to them on the third day, Do this and live, for I fear Elohim. If you are trustworthy, let one of your brothers be confined to your prison house, and you go bring grain for the scarcity of food for your houses. This should actually shed a bit of concern. One of the brothers stayed in prison. Only nine got to leave. Interesting. And bring your youngest brother to me and let your words be confirmed and you do not die. And so they did. And they said to each other, truly we are guilty concerning our brother for we saw the distress of his life when he pleaded with us, yet we did not listen. This is why this distress has come upon us. They've realized they're reaping what they've sowed with their brother Joseph. And Reuben said to them, Did I not speak to you, saying, Do not sin against the boy, and you would not listen? And see, his blood is now required of us. And they did not know that Yosef understood them, for he spoke to them through an interpreter. And he turned himself away from them and wept, but came back to them and spoke to them. And he took Shimon from them and bound him before their eyes. What's interesting about this, this would have been the first time that Yosef would have known that Reuben tried to protect him. Why do you think, I believe this is why Yosef turns away to weep. Because he, he's spent, what, 13, no, 13 plus uh, 12, uh, 9 years. So this is nearly 20 years. And he's thought, all my brothers have screwed me over. This is the first time he gets to hear this. What? He tried to protect me? I also believe this is why he kept Shimon instead of Reuben. Whilst he would have normally kept the firstborn captive, Think about this, because you keep the firstborn, don't you? Because this is the, the, uh, the one that has the firstborn blessing. It's, um, 
It's a good pledge, shall we say. Instead of that, he takes Shimon. And I believe it's because he heard what Reuben said just then. He was like, you know what? I'll pass it on down. I can't remember off the top of my head. Um, I didn't look into that. You can take all the, the names of the, of the sons, though, and it basically tells you the whole plan of salvation. If you take all the... Because when the sons were named, the mother would say a phrase, and if you take all those phrases together, you've got the whole plan of salvation there. It's really amazing, actually. Oh, uh, and Yosef commanded, and they filled their sacks with grain, also to put every, every back every man's silver to his sack, and to give them food for the journey, and thus it was done for them. And so they loaded their donkeys with the grain and went from there. And as one of them opened his sack to give his donkey fodder at the lodging place, he saw his silver, and there it was in the mouth of the sack. It's only, only one of them opens and realizes, oh my goodness, my silver's still here. What's going on? And he said to his brothers, my silver has been returned, and there it is in my sack. And their hearts sank, for they were afraid, saying to each other, what is this that Elohim has done to us? <laughs> the brothers go back home to their father and report everything that has happened. How the governor of Egypt treated them harshly, how he expected the brothers to bring down Benjamin as proof of their honest intentions. Um, everything gets related. And then what happens is, and it came to be as they emptied their sacks, that look, so now all of the brothers are emptying their sacks, and they see that all their silver is still there. And when they and their fathers saw the bundles of silver, they were afraid. And Yaakov, their father, said to them, you have bereaved me. Yosef is no more, and Shimon is no more, and you would take ben Benjamin. All of this is against me. So Reuben spoke to his father, saying, Take the lives of my two sons if I do not bring him back to you. Put him in my hands, and I myself bring him back to you. Again, Reuben is trying to get some credibility back from his father for what he did to his father's concubine. But he said, My son is not going down with you, for his brother is dead, and he is left alone. If any harm should come to him along with the along the way in which you go, then you would bring down my grey hairs with sorrow to the grave. He's still got, Yaakov's still got that favouritism thing. Imagine, do you know what I mean? Like, the, the brother was gone, would you feel the same if I died, father? He's basically saying, he's my favourite. What's interesting, the brothers probably thought that with Yosef gone, the problem would have been solved, and actually they made it worse, because now Yaakov is even more protective over Benjamin. So, what they thought would have solved their problem made their problem worse. Let, this is a lesson to us. Just don't meddle. Don't meddle. So let's move to chapter 43. But the scarcity of food was severe in the land. And it came to be when they had eaten up the grain which they had brought back from its shrine that their father said to them, go back, buy us a little food. But Yehuda spoke with them, saying, the man vehemently warned against us, saying, you do not see my face unless your brother is with you. And if you let our brother go with us, we go down and buy food. But if you do not let him go, we do not go down, because the man said to us, you do not see my face unless your brother is with you. What's interesting is that Yaakov was willing to just like leave Shimon in jail down in uh, Egypt, just so that he could hold on to Benjamin. I mean... <laughs> And Yisrael said, why did you do evil to me to inform the man that you still had another brother? And they said, the man kept asking about us and our relatives, saying, is your father still alive? Have you another brother? And we informed him according to these words. How could we know what he would say? Bring your brother down. And Yehuda said to Yisrael, his father, send the boy with me and let us arise and go and live and not die, both we and you and also our little ones. I myself shall stand guarantee for him. What's interesting, Yahudah is doing the same, saying the same thing that Reuben said, but yet Yaakov will choose Yahudah over Reuben. From my hand you are to require him. If I do not bring him back to you and set him before you, then let me bear the blame forever. For if we had not delayed truly by now, we could have returned the second time. It would seem that Yahudah is finally starting to make amends. He's maturing. Because what did he do? It was his idea to sell Joseph in the first place. They were going to kill him. He's like, actually, you know what? Let's make some money on this. Now, Yehuda, I would suggest, is maybe starting to own up to his guilt. We're going to see this play out. In Exodus 22, 
this is gonna, this is a side note now. It's quite interesting though. When a man gives to his neighbour a donkey or ox or sheep or any beast to watch over and it dies or is injured or is driven away while no one is looking, let an oath of Yah be between them both that he has not put his hand into his neighbour's goods and the owner of it shall accept that and he does not repay. This is how powerful an oath to Yah was back then. But if indeed it is stolen from him, he repays to its owner. Now this is the key. If it is torn to pieces, then let him bring it for evidence he does not repay what was torn. Now, what did the brothers do? So they took Yosef's robe, killed a male goat, dipped the robe into the blood, sent the long robe, brought it to their father, said, we have found this. What's the result? It is my son's robe, an evil beast has devoured him. Yosef is torn, torn to pieces. They literally brought false evidence to clear their guilt, according to Torah. But it was false evidence nonetheless. They twisted the Torah, to acquit themselves of guilt. Do, do we do this? Let me give you a, a modern day example. You know that outside at school, the driving limit is usually at 20 miles an hour. Why? Because it, there's children around. Now let's say I'm driving 18 miles an hour and I see a kid and I just, oh, I'm just going to go straight into him. And they go, why did you do that? Well, well, I was driving under 20 miles an hour. Don't you know? I'm fine. This is what they were doing. They were, they were, do, you, do you see what I'm trying to get at? Do we twist the Torah in such a way, his commands, uh, to justify our behavior and you know, w work around it? This is not on. However, this was not Yaakov's ethic. We know when he was speaking to Laban, that which was torn by beast I did not bring to you, I myself bore the loss of it. You required it from my hand, whether stolen by day or stolen by night. What, instead of bringing the evidence to it, he bore the loss. He went above and beyond. Now compare that with what Yehuda said to his father. I myself shall stand guarantee for him. From my hand you are to require, uh, require him. If I do not bring him back to you and set him before you, then let me blame the the bl bear the blame forever. Easy enough for me to say. What I'm suggesting is that Yehuda had finally mat matured and stepped up to his father's standard of going above and beyond. Not just doing the status quo, going above and beyond. Now if Yaakov represents the father of the tribes, but also Yisrael, this implies that the standard of, by which we are to live is very high. The, are, are we just coasting along and doing you know, the minimum requirements, or are we going above and beyond our master's rules? This reminded me of this, Yeshua's words. But who of you, having a servant, ploughing or shepherding, would say to him, when he has come in from the field, come immediately and sit down to eat? But would he not rather say to him, prepare somewhat for my supper, and gird yourself and serve me while I eat and drink, and afterward you shall eat and drink? Would he thank that servant because he did what he was commanded? I think not. So you also, when you have done all that you were commanded, Say, we are unworthy servants. We have done what was our duty to do. One thing that I, 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 it's beginning to really like, it aggravates me is when I see self-righteousness. We go, oh, well, I'm keeping the Torah and I'm doing this and I'm doing that. Where's my gold star? Where's my biscuit? That's your duty. It's your duty to do that. Paul picked up on this in Romans 12. I call upon you therefore, brothers, through the compassion of Elohim, to present your bodies a living offering, set apart, well-pleasing to Elohim, your reasonable worship. It's your reasonable worship to be set apart. It's your reasonable worship to be well-pleasing to the Father. So next time you want to give yourself a pat on the back for being also holy, you are that servant that's simply doing what they're supposed to do. It should humble us. It should humble us. We are unworthy servants. We have simply done what we were supposed to do. Now, tying this back to the Torah portion is that Yehuda and Jacob were going above and beyond. This merits a commendation from the master, going above and beyond. This goes back to the story of the, of the ten gold coins. What has the father given you? And what are you doing with the coins he's given you? Are, you? are you burying it in the ground? Or are you simply taking five coins and giving him five coins? Or are you multiplying that? Are you going above and beyond? 
Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind so that you prove what is that good and well-pleasing and perfect desire of Elohim. Let's go back to a talk. Everyone with me? Cool. And their father Israel said to them, If so, then do this. Take some of the best fruit of the land in your vessels and bring a present down for the man. A little balm, a little honey, spices and myrrh, nuts and almonds. This is burial spices again, which is interesting. They're going to meet the type of shadow of Messiah with burial spices. And take double silver in your hand and take back in your hand the silver that was returned in the mouth of your sacks. It could have been a mistake. And take your brother and arise, go back to the man. And now should I give you compassion before the man so that he shall release your brother, uh, your other brother and Benjamin. And if and I, if I am bereaved, I am bereaved. The brothers, okay, so they, they're brought before Yosef's house for a meal. The brothers actually end up fearing. They think that basically Yosef is going to capture them and take their donkeys because of the whole thing of finding their silver in the bags. Then they, they own up. They, they, go, they go to the servant, the head of the house, and say, look, this is what happened, and we're really sorry. Like, we, we, we gave you the silver, and it just appeared in our bags. And this is what he says. Peace be with you. Do not be afraid. Your Elohim and the Elohim of your father has given you treasure in your sacks. Your silver has come to me. So like, it's kind of, you know, it's almost mind games playing with the brothers. The brothers are seated around the table by order of birth, to which they uh, realize they don't know this is Yosef. How is it that this complete stranger was able to sit them all according to birth order? They must have really thought that Elohim was against them. They're thinking, oh boy, we're in for it now. You know, we're paying for our sins. Okay. This is what Yosef speaking to the brothers while they're having this meal. He said, he asked them about their welfare and is your father well, the old man of whom you spoke? And they reply, your servant, our father, is in good health. Now, who knows what that word is in the Hebrew? It's shalom. So really, what that should read is, and he asked them if they had shalom. Does your father have shalom? And they said, your servant, our father, has shalom. And look, look at what it means. It's completeness, safety, welfare, peace, quiet. I love what that peace of human relationships and peace with God, especially in covenant relationship. I just put that there to give you when you say Shabbat Shalom to someone. Shalom is more than just have a nice day. There's all it's soundness of mind. I mean, since coming and doing this walk, I have that 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 hole that was inside of me is now filled. Do you, do you know what I mean? That, that Elohim-shaped hole is now filled and is constantly being enriched. I, I have peace of mind. Shalom. I'm still. There's, no, there's so much more. So when you say Shabbat Shalom to each other, realize the fullness of that word. And he commanded the one over his house saying, fill the men's sacks with food as they are able to bear. Put each man's silver in the mouth of his sack. So they get Shimon back. They get all sent off. And Joseph basically saying, look, do the same thing again. Put my cup, the silver cup, in the mouth of the sack of the youngest and the silver for his grain. And he did according to the word of Yosef, which he spoke. And as the morning was light, the men were sent away, they and their donkeys. And when they had gone out from the city, not having gone far, Yosef said to the one over his house, rise up, follow the men. And when you overtake them, say to them, why have you repaid evil for good? So clearly all his servants are probably in on what he's doing to some degree. Is this not the one from which my master drinks and with which he indeed divines? You have done evil in what you have done. By the way, Yosef wasn't actually divining in the cup. He's just saying, say this to them. Yosef is setting the brothers up. He's basically recreating the situation he was in all those years ago, but with Benjamin instead, in the hot seat, so to speak. He's going to see what, how are the brothers going to react if I put them in the same position. Have they matured? Have they repented for their sin regarding me? Remember that both Yosef and Benjamin were sons of the same mother. They were, you know, the favoured mother, sons of Rachel. Okay, let's look at some interesting uh, things about Benjamin. Beloved by the father, full brother to Yosef, favoured. Born near Bethlehem. Hmm. Rahel named him Ben-Oni, which means son of sorrow. Father named him Benjamin, which means son of my right hand. Can you see what I'm trying to get at? 
Bethlehem, son of Soros, exalted to the right hand, was not involved in the plot to sell Yosef. Okay, what I'm alluding to is, will the brothers sell their brother again, given the chance? We're going to see, I'm going to build another picture. So he overtook them and spoke these words to them. And they said to him, why does my master say these words? Far be it from us that your servant should do according to this word. So we brought back, see, we brought back to you from the land of Canaan, the silver which we found in the mouth of our sacks. How then should we steal silver or gold from your master's house? With whomever your servant it is found, he shall die, and we shall become my master's slaves as well. Now they're starting to be, um, they're owning their problems. They're starting to take responsibility for their actions. And he said, now let it be according to your words. He with whom is found, whom it is found becomes my slave, and you are innocent. So he gives them the chance of freedom. And they hurried, and each man let down his sack to the ground and opened each sack. And he searched with the oldest first and with the youngest last. And the cup was found in Benjamin's sack. I mean, can you imagine the tension all the way down, like right at the last one? Please, please. Ah. And they tore their garments, and each man loaded his donkey and went back to the city. What did the man say? You, you can be free. Just, you know, let your brother go. Let him become a slave. You can have your freedom. What do the brothers do? They go back. They care. Can we see the change from what happened to Yosef to now what is happening with Benjamin? The brothers had a chance of freedom, yet they went back. And Yehuda and his brothers came to the Yosef's house, and he was still there. And they fell before him on the ground. I mean, there's no pride there. They're just on the floor. And Yosef said to them, what deed is this you have done? Did you not know that a man like me indeed divines? And Yehuda said, what do we say to my master? What do we speak? How do we clear ourselves? Elohim has found out the crookedness of your servant. See, we are my master's slaves, both we and he also with whom the cup was found. They're willing to go all in with him. They're sharing the burden of responsibility. But he said, Yosef, far be it for me to do this. The man in whose hand the cup was found, he becomes my slave. And you go up in peace to your father. Again, he's testing them. He's given them, go on, you can go if you want. Again, Yosef is giving the brothers a chance at freedom. He is testing them to see if they have repented. Okay, who was it that conspired to sell Yosef? Yehuda. And this is your scripture. Who was it that sold Yeshua for silver? What's Judas in Yehuda? The 12 of them called Yehuda from Kiriot. It was They were both called Yehuda. Will Yehuda show that he has truly repented and changed? That's where the Torah portion stops. Cliffhanger. I'm joking, I'm joking. <laughs> the, the, the Torah portion does actually stop there, but we're going to go a bit further ahead. We're going to go a bit further ahead. Um, this is my encore, shall we call it. Uh, and Yehud, So this is his reply. Yehuda came near to him and said, O oh, my master, please let your servant speak a word in my master's hearing and do not let your displeasure burn against your servant, for you are like Pharaoh. My master asked his servant this, have you a father or a brother? He, he basically recounts the whole thing, being honest. And we said to my master, we have a father, an old man, and a young child of his old age, and his brother is dead, and he alone is left of his mother's children, and his father loves him. And you said to your servants, bring him down to me, and let my eyes see him. And we said to our, my master, the boy is not able to leave his father, for if he leaves his father, his father shall die. But you said to your servants, unless you... The whole time, they're, they're, your servants, your servants, my father, your servant, humility. Unless your youngest brother comes down with you, you do not see my face again. And it came to be when we went up to your servant, my father, that we saw, told him the words of my master. And our father said, go back and buy us a little food. But we said, we are not able to go down. If our youngest brother is with us, then we shall go down. For we are not able to see the man's face unless our younger brother is with us. Then your servant, my father, said to us, you know what my wife, you know that my wife bore me two sons. 
<laughs> again, I mean, and the one went out for me and I said, truly he is torn, torn to pieces and I have not seen him since. And if you take this one from me too and harm comes to him, you shall bring my gray hair with evil to the grave. And now if I come to your servant, my father, and the boy is not with us, since his own life is bound up in his life, then it shall be when he sees that the boy is not with us that he shall die. So your servant shall bring down the grey hair of your servant, our father, with evil to the grave. For your servant went guarantee for the boy to my father, saying, if I do not bring him back to you, then I shall be a sinner before my father forever. And listen, and now please let your servant remain instead of the boy as a slave to my master and let the boy up go up with his brothers. He's not even saying let the brothers, just him. Let the blame be on me. Let them go free. He's owning up to, he's, he's keeping to his word. For how do I go up to my father if the boy is not with me, lest I see the evil that would have come upon my father? The first time, Yehudah sold his brother, didn't he, Yosef? The second time, he interceded for his brother and was willing to take the guilt. The house of Yehudah sold Yeshua, i.e. their brother. It, that, that was the, the fulfilment of the type and shadow. Will there come a time when the house of Yehudah will intercede for their brother again? We're yet to see this. I'm suggesting from the type and shadow. Well, can you see what I'm getting at? Judas himself of sold Joseph, willing to plead for Benjamin. Now, they sold Yeshua, i.e. Judah, a corporate we're still waiting for an intercession for the son of the beloved father, the beloved son of the father. I just want that to stay in the back of your minds. Will Yehuda plead for their brother again? I hope this has been a blessing. Next week we'll see what happened, how Yosef was, you know, he, he owns up to everything. I hope it's been a blessing.